Tori Amos will talk about her new album and her synesthesia she gets while playing or listening to music. It just seemed really natural that you could see patterns and different things, color icebergs, creatures, almost like you're traveling in another galaxy. This is Sound and Vision on KEXP. Sexual assault is something Tori Amos detailed in a song she released in 1992 called Me and a Gun. It was about an experience she had when she was in her early 20s. It was me and a gun and a man on my back. Tori Amos ended up being the first national spokesperson for RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. That was back in 1994. She has just released a new album, and on it is a song called 29 Years, released 29 years after she put out Me and a Gun. I caught up with her recently to talk more about her song, 29 Years. I guess the message in the song is that we can be people that we think think, okay, this is who I am, this is my identity, and then a traumatizing event happens. And then, sometimes without even knowing it, through, well, through my life, you begin to make decisions, choices, you react, you're drawn to things and people from your wounded self. I just want that to land. Um, I know a lot of people will will relate to this because they they've they've experienced it. And so instead of taking the time, you know, I say counting 10 Mississippi backwards before reacting or making that choice, sometimes it's like, "Tori, are you coming from this wounded, damaged self or are you going to apply the things you've learned, the things you've learned over many years, the signs to look for of when you're making a self-destructive choice, or you're doing something to hurt somebody else. Take those blinders off and really look at, at what you're doing. And 29 years is exploring that with the first line, really, no, Medusa was not always a Gorgon. And she wasn't. She wasn't. Uh, until Athena sided with her uncle, who raped her in Athena's temple, and Medusa was blamed. So that was the mi the myth, the archetype that grounds 29 years into, okay, we're not always our damage. That was Tori Amos. We'll hear more about her new album next hour on Sound and Vision. Meanwhile, here's her song, 29 Years.
This is Sound and Vision on KEXP. I'm Emily Fox. Tori Amos has been at it for a while. She got signed to Atlantic Records in the late 80s and made waves when she released this song, Cornflake Girl, in the 90s. Ever was a cornflake girl. And yesterday, she released her 16th studio album. It's called Ocean to Ocean. Ocean to ocean, tales of the sea. I caught up with Tori Amos for a home in Cornwall, England, to talk about the record, mental health, the pandemic, creativity, and her synesthesia. So you were a child prodigy on the piano. Um, you taught yourself how to play, was the youngest person to be admitted to the prestigious music conservatory, the Peabody Institute, when you were five. And I read that since you were young, you saw music as light patterns, like a form of synesthesia. Describe what that looks like for you. Uh, well, I I could play music before I remember anything. It's kind of weird because it's not something I questioned at the time. And my mom would say, you know, that I would say, can you hear that? Can you hear that, mom? Can you hear the strings? Can you hear this? Can you see this? <laughs> and she'd be like, what are you talking about? Bless her. She was a very loving woman. So it was never in a shameful way. It was never like, uh, you weirdo kid of mine. <laughs> it was, okay, tell, tell me about it. So it just seemed really natural that you could see patterns and, and different things, color, icebergs, Whoa. Um, creatures, almost like you're traveling in another galaxy. And it was hard to describe, but music could really take me from sitting on that piano bench anywhere. And it, and it could have been listening to a Beatles track, listening to a record, and I could travel. So when you are writing music, do you does this happen to you? Like, is that a part of your writing process when you're able to not only hear what you're creating, but actually see what you're creating? Sometimes, absolutely. And then sometimes it's complete torture. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was there was there any song off of this latest album that you were able to also see through synesthesia? Well, you know, when people talk to me about it, it's it's something that I've been doing since I remember what diapers were. So it's just very strange. It's like breathing. I don't really analyze it. So sometimes I get a bit taken aback when people bring... I didn't even know what the word meant <laughs> <laughs> until some some journalist asked me about it a few years ago. I'm saying, Sina, what? Uh, because, because it's just part of the creative process where your senses, your senses are tapping into things that you you don't even maybe consciously realize. That is just... It's just happening. And when the muses visit me, it's a very, very different experience. All doors are open when they're around. Everything is possible. Can you tell me more about the muses and, 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 and what they do for you in your songwriting? They kick my butt and they let me know when my own work that I'm noodling about, when I'm just, you know, doing my practicing, whatever that word is, noodling, practicing, jamming, just kind of going, you know, I'm here at the piano right now here. And so sometimes, you, you know, you're just jamming. And, and then maybe they come, and then maybe they don't come. <laughs> and and when they don't come, it's a bit, it's a bit of a bummer because because they char they have this charge when they come in it's like it's like fairy dust it's like this dust they sprinkle on everything and yet they can be tough teachers they can be okay stop wallowing and and let's pull back and really experience being in the mud if we're going to if we're going to talk about this let's really feel it on every level so so then i go into it you know, what does it smell like? Where am I? What's happening here? What do I taste? What am I seeing? So, so then they then they push, and then you start really bringing all the senses together. But but they are orchestrating it. What's kind of sometimes 
a, a bit soul destroying is when you're sitting there waiting for not waiting for the muses but going um it's been months now yeah. <laughs> hello you remember and and you kind of get into your head and what's tricky is when you think um what do, do they not like what i do anymore so you really you i i've had to put a discipline in place which is okay st don't take it to that place or let's not go to that place you just need to be open and keep doing your work. So I keep researching and keep trying things and keep expanding. And I have, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of bits of music that I, I will collect. And some of it, you know, is, is fine. But when they come, then, wow, mm. it's just different. That's amazing. You know, when I was reading your latest book, um, Resistance, you know, in it, um, and especially at the end, you talked about, you know, this idea of uh, creative uh, paralysis, you know, and that's just a part of, you know, being a creative, especially you who's done this, you know, since you were five, <laughs> you know, being signed at a very early age now out with your 16th album. Um, you know, I'm curious how... I guess creativity has kind of ebbed and flowed in your career, but also what were the creative sparks that inspired this latest record? A couple things. I think what got me out of my funky space, which, you know, it, I wasn't in, in the muck until the third lockdown, just so you know. And I know you guys are in America. I don't know what the lockdowns looked like, but they were pretty severe over here in the UK at certain points whereby there would be police people there's a big road in to to Devon and Cornwall and they would be there and if you didn't have the right license plates you could not come in so it was very much a lockdown situation yes the tractors could roll the farmers could roll there were people if you were part of the supply chain that could happen and we were very fortunate to have a recording studio in the old barn here behind the farmhouse however i think by that third lockdown if i'm honest with you not playing live music for that way i think there were a few things that were happening at the same time a bit of the madness after the election and what kind of cockamamie madness is all this when I believe in a democratic system? And, you know, my candidates lost too, but I don't throw all my toys out of the pram and want to torch democracy to the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I am a little arsonist, my friend. <laughs> so, okay, come on. You know, let's get out the tequila and boo hoo. Okay. Somebody wins, somebody loses, but we have a democratic process. And that's the most important thing, no matter to me who wins or loses. So, yeah, I hit a wall. Oh, yeah. I hit a wall by the mid end of January. What I just took my hands, put them up, and said, I, I cannot stay in this energy anymore. And so I went quiet. I went silent. I started reading books. I let go of the songs I'd been writing for months and months and months and months and months and months. And months. Okay, a couple bar phrases were kept. That's just part of the process. But then, nothing until the muses said to me, okay, you're despondent, hmm. so you need to write from this place. In order to get yourself out of your private little hell tea, you've got to write your way out of it. That's the only way out. You've done it before, a long time ago, you've done it before. So that's what you need to do. And metal, water, wood. Yeah, I was going to say, what were some of the first songs that, that came to you after that silence? That one came, and 
it pulled me outside because I I turned to to fight the monster of sadness or I guess depression despondency to fight that monster I turned to fighters I started researching fighters like mm. okay 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 get the gloves on tour you need to fight the monster fight the monster and then I look up Bruce Lee mm. and Bruce Lee goes make like a bee be like water and I'm really that's how we're gonna fight this and Emily that's how I began turning things around that's when the floodgates opened and I went outside and started listening to the trees watching how they communicate reading about the underground networks of the fungi and that it's the wood wide web and how trees communicate with each other and I thought well they're doing way better than humanity so I'm gonna <laughs> hang with them I'm speaking with Tori Amos about her latest album, Ocean to Ocean. Can you tell me more about that song, Speaking with Trees? Speaking with Trees is all about all kinds of things. I think it's about grieving. I think it's about finding a rhythm language, which we, as a group of musicians, we were working from ocean to ocean, literally. We were, we're here at um, the TARDIS in Cornwall, and it would go out to Matt Chamberlain, who had his studio not far from the Pacific Ocean. And then, you know, etc. It would come back and go to all the other musicians. And so, in a way, we were finding a language to speak about losses and grief. And part, part of my mother's in this. She, you know, she, well, she passed two years ago. And I, I began to really feel her spirit when I went out to the trees and saw how they were communicating and realized I needed to find another way of trying to communicate with her. And so nature was really a way for me to learn, to watch how Mother Earth, Earth Mother, was not in lockdown. She was regenerating. While she was combating fires and floods and everything else, she was also rebirthing. And I, and I found this humbling and immense at the same time. And I thought, right, I want to write something that reflects this 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 amazing ability of, of accepting the death cycle and process while the birth or rebirth um, cycle is, it's like a baton. It's handing the baton off. And, and I just, I was enraptured with her process. Mm. It sounds like you, were, you also became so connected to nature during this time as well. I did. I got out there in the gales, and the Cornish coast is quite something. Sometimes there is a calmness to it, but sometimes it's like a ferocious beauty. Mm. The rocks, the crags, I mean, it's, um, it feels very ancient, and it doesn't suffer fools. And, and if you don't approach the cliffs, you, you might really hurt yourself and slide and break something because that, that's just what they are. It, it isn't necessarily for the faint-hearted. So you have to come with it with a certain respect. And, and once I did that, there was such a sense of, um, wow, she's got this. Hmm. Cornwall has this. The, ain't, the land has got this. She's going to be fine. So that was so comforting, Emily, <laughs> no, knowing, okay, with all these people being challenged and going through this, it felt like, wow, you know, nature can be our great mother, our great teacher, but I have to just watch her and learn from her. 
Well, I've been speaking with Tori Amos about her latest album, Ocean to Ocean. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Emily. All the best. Ocean.